Hey there everyone, welcome back to the Alpha of the Eagle channel. My name is Matt. Sorry that this video is late. I had to redo the recording that I had last week due to some errors with uh, the camera and with the sound. So once again, I do apologize for that. Now today, we're going to be starting a new series called uh, Adapting Fantasy, uh, the eternal battle between the fans and uh, the media. And what I mean by that, not so much Hollywood, but television shows, uh, and film, especially those two mediums. Sometimes you'll have a comic book adapta adaptation of a fantasy book that you like. Um, and overall, I just wanted to kind of address this. And even uh, video games, too, sometimes do adaptations of fantasy works. And so where is the kind of happy medium that most people get when considering what's good out of an adaptation and what's not? And I'm going to highlight a few uh, things here uh, to mention that. But before we begin, uh, tomorrow I'm going to have a board game review up for the Lord of the Rings card game. This is a card game that is nearing its end through Fantasy Flight, so I wanted to review it before it was completely gone. And then uh, it's also a video, uh, video game. Wow. It's also a card game that you can play on Steam. And that's one of the reasons why I think that the Lord of the Rings card game is ending is because there were so many cards for it that you can just go on Steam and have all the cards downloaded. And on Monday, it'll be Book Review Monday, we're doing the, bath, the Path of Daggers, Wheel of Time number 8. So, without further ado, so I'm just going to reach for something here. We're going to talk about the art of adaptation as far as uh, fantasy goes, especially high fantasy. Uh, but I will be talking about some low fantasy here and there. So, my first exposure to this was actually when I watched the massive amount of documentaries uh, on the extended edition of Lord of the Rings uh, the uh, from 2001 to 2003 and a lot of those DVDs had you know reasons for why certain things were cut if you watched from book to screen I think was what it was called um, there was the screenwriters there who were explaining why certain things were done why um, you know things were removed or things were added uh, for the sake of the story and that got me thinking even years down the line about the art of adapting uh, something as large as fantasy. So when you take a book that's as massive as Lord of the Rings um, or a book series that's as large as Wheel of Time or Sword of Truth, and we might be seeing this soon with Wheel of Time since there is a TV show in the works, um, you have to wonder, you know, what's going on in the back of everyone's mind. So we're going to start with probably what I consider to be one of the most accurate um, adaptations that a TV show has ever done with a fantasy book, and that is A Game of Thrones, the first book in A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, when I read that, it was years before the show came out, and I don't even think I finished. And then when the show came out, I watched that fully, and then read the book, and was shocked, really, to see how accurate the material was. Uh, the show left out a few scenes, but they were scenes that weren't very essential, uh, like traveling scenes. And you know me, I love to talk about the idea of writing chapters about walking is not necessary. But uh, there are a few of those in A Game of Thrones, the first book, at least, in the Song of Ice and Fire series. And those were removed from the show. Not all of them, but some of them were removed from the show. And... Otherwise, you could sit there with the book in front of the TV and read through and actually see, wow, they really got everything down here. They, they did it 100%. This is all incredibly accurate. Uh, I really appreciated season one of Game of Thrones for doing that. Now, as you move forward in the Game of Thrones TV show, uh, going into A Clash of Kings, uh, a, song, a Song of Swords... I don't know. The third one. It's been so long since I've read them. A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons. It started to, they started to take liberties with the material. Now, I'm not sure if this was done by the consent of George R.R. R. Martin or not, but you start to see that some of the things that actually made the book slow down were removed for the show, especially with book three, because book three was so long. And you got a chance to really kind of be engaged the whole time. I'm not saying that I disliked A Clash of Kings, uh, but there was just part of it which was not confusing, but it, it's slow. 
slow. And you know the name of that book? I'm going to go check because it is going to bother me. So be right back, everybody. Sorry about that. That was a storm of swords, not a song of swords. Uh, so a storm of swords being the longest, I think, or second longest in the series. There was a lot that, you know, kind of needed to be adapted properly. The, the team over there at HBO is doing a fine job. However, you know, there is that never-ending argument over the idea of, well, the show's going to be done before the book series is going to be done. And that's something I want to touch upon with, with the art of adaptation as well. Because there was one other series that almost ran into this danger. That was the, the Harry Potter film series versus the speed at which the book was coming out. So, a Harry Potter about... It was book four, I think... I believe when the movies started coming out uh, it was 2001 for Philo uh, Philosopher's Stone or Sorcerer's Stone whichever version you've seen um, and I think it was 03 for Order of the Phoenix the book came out I'm probably wrong I'm probably wrong but what was interesting to see was that the films were catching up and so the books had to be released a bit faster but by the time the Order of the Phoenix film came out Deathly Hallows the book had been released so in the case of Harry Potter, the author was able to reach before the show got there. Not so much in Game of Thrones, and that does bother a few people. That is going to be one of the other videos I do um, as part of this series, what happens when the entertainment source material goes beyond the written source material. And yes, I know I use source material with both. There actually is a difference there. There is such a thing as show source material versus book show source material. And that leads me into my second series that I want to talk about. When you take the art of adaptation to the other extreme and create this. So, Terry Goodkind's Wizard's First Rule is a fine book. It's very Arthurian, as I said in my uh, Wizard's First Rule review. Uh, it gets a lot of criticism for being too Arthurian and very basic fantasy, but it's fun. It's an adventure story that grows with the series. And, of course, the cover that I have here in the trade paperback is to promote the television series Legend of the Seeker. This is where we get the other extreme. I had just finished this book... I was about maybe midway through Stone of Tears when I started watching Legend of the Seeker. Found it on Hulu. And I'm watching the first episode, and within the first few minutes, I'm like, something is desperately wrong. They have taken this source material and adapted it in a way that just doesn't make any sense with the original book. On top of the fact that the show was called Legend of the Seeker. It wasn't called Wizard's First Rule. Though, interestingly enough, there are um, statements out there saying that originally it was called Wizard's First Rule. But because they were taking the source material into their own hands and just doing whatever they wanted with it, that they wanted to call it something different. So it was more like an episodic adventure. You'd have you know one here, one here. Then there was no overarching storyline to the show. That was until about seven or eight episodes in when they finally mentioned the boxes of Orden. Now, you know fairly early on in Wizard's First Rule about these boxes. Maybe not immediately, but you know very early about these boxes. And in the show, they don't really get mentioned until episode seven. Um, all that the Seeker had correctly was for... for we're talking about episodes two and and up to seven uh, were names. Nothing really much else matched with the source material. Yes, you had Kaelin and Denis running into the area where the barrier was. Denis dies. Um, Richard gets bit by the plant, but he, he does that after he saves Kaelin in the woods. Um, the order of events is all off, and you sit there as a fan of the book going, Why? But, this is where things are interesting. I went back recently, and I read the first few chapters of Wizard's First Rule again, and I was like, hmm, could the show be more interesting than the book? And the answer is no. Because um, <laughs> here's where the idea comes into play that, as fans of high fantasy, every once in a while... Your favorite source material is going to be adapted. And what you have to do, honestly, is separate the source material 
and uh, the show or the movie. It's very hard to do, especially with a classic, which brings you to my third example, the Hobbit trilogy. The Hobbit trilogy um, is very divisive among fans. Uh, the first movie is generally seen as one of the more accurate as far as language goes. I could see where the argument would falter a little bit. But, you know, I could take a look at the book, especially in that first chapter, and the language is almost exactly the same, and I've got to give them credit for that. But as the series went on, and even the movie itself went on, things were different. And it became very clear to me that what they were adapting was a classic children's novel into an action-adventure chase uh, all the way from the Shire to um, Erebor. Now... I have to say, if I had a chance, I'd, I'd watch the movies, especially if they were on TV. I do realize there are problems with it, but the only reason I've been able to enjoy them to a certain extent is because I've had to tell myself these are two separate things. The Hobbit is a book that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote at the uh, very early parts of his Middle Earth published career because he had written all these other stories that were not being published about Middle Earth. And then he wrote Lord of the Rings later. Here is a director uh, who is um, who has directed Lord of the Rings to great success. Uh, and some people still consider it to be one of the best trilogies ever made up there with the likes of the original Star Wars trilogy. And he's now directing a series of movies that are supposed to take place beforehand. The jobs of the two people are different. Tolkien wrote a standalone story and then wrote a sequel with a few tiny threads cl uh, connecting the two. And then, of course, once you get going, they kind of take off. Peter Jackson directed this successful uh, film franchise and is being informed that do what you can to connect the two as much as you can. And that's the difference between the two as far as art of adaptation. And I'm talking about these things because for the next few weeks... In this series, I'm going to be titling them with certain book names that have sh stuck out to me with as, as far as fantasy goes. Um, the Game of Thrones television show versus A Song of Ice and Fire. We're going to do Legend of the Seeker versus uh, Sword of Truth. Uh, we're going to do uh, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. That might be a little bit of a longer video. Uh, versus the film Saga. Uh, we're also going to be taking a look at Harry Potter. Uh, what they did as far as art of adaptation goes in that. And we're going to take a look at Wheel of Time. Now, the reason I, I want to bring this up is because I know I've already done the the graphic novel, but there's something to be said about the way that graphic novel was done compared to the book. So I will be doing a video on that one. Uh, I'm also going to be taking a look at adapting fantasy as a whole. This is just an intro video. It's not going to be anywhere close to 20 minutes. And these are a few of the things that I'll be... Uh, making much longer and adapting fantasy as a whole is very difficult this may not look like a long book sorry got it backwards uh, but it is fairly lengthy it's just shy of 300,000 words I believe uh, when you look at things like Lord of the Rings those are very long books as well you've got the Harry Potter books while most of them towards the beginning were shorter they got very lengthy after a time fantasy is not an easy subject to translate to a screen be that film tv or video game because of its length uh, fantasy books especially high fantasy books tend to be longer they tend to be epic they tend to try to tell this major storyline while throwing in all these other plot points and i think that there is a difficulty in adapting something like that so in the next uh, other weeks, and next week we'll have one because this video got out way too late, uh, we'll be talking about the art of adaptation, and we're going to start with uh, A Song of Ice and Fire versus the TV show Game of Thrones. And um, just talking mainly about the extremes taking, the, uh, what, what did they choose to keep very close. Uh, same thing with Sword of Truth. While this show only ran for two seasons, we'll probably only mention everything out of the first six books. I think that's all... Oh, no, sorry. First seven books, because there's a reason for that. Um, and I just think that overall we'll have an a, a interesting subject matter here to take a look. And 
is there such a thing as accepting what was presented or do we still fight and say we want a loyal adaptation and in that final concluding video i think i'll wrap up my thoughts on that because there is a lot here in these series to look at uh, and these are some of the series that have taken uh, that have been taken and done um Granted, I don't know if I would put Legend of the Seeker in here, but Game of Thrones has been done to great success. Lord of the Rings, great success. Harry Potter, great success. There is a fan base for Legend of the Seeker, but not as large of a fan base as the ones I just mentioned. I might bring up, uh, depending on if I have enough time, um, the Shannara Chronicles, uh, the Magicians, uh, any other ones that you guys would like me to take a look at, please let me know in the comments below. And as a few last minute things I want to talk about here, if you haven't considered subscribing already, please do. And then hit that bell icon to be notified every time I upload a video. And um, I had mentioned this last time, I'm going to mention it again. If you are interested in Saga of the Black Phoenix, the fantasy series that I'm writing, I'll put a link below. Or if you're even more interested about it and would like a copy please contact me at alphaoftheeagle at gmail.com. Um, I can get some information from you, sign a copy, and send it off to you. Thank you for joining me for this intro video on what I would start calling the art of adaptation, taking high fantasy work and bringing it to a screen in a um, easy-to-watch format. It's not always easy because fantasy is a tricky genre to begin with. And I hope to see you next week. We'll be taking a look at A Song of Ice and Fire versus HBO's Game of Thrones. Thanks for watching, everybody.